I actually don't feel prepared to give my comments right now. I haven't had a chance to be able to review the entire uh, last meeting. And honestly, the meeting before that, I was on a train in Chicago and didn't have the best audio. So I need to catch up a bit. Um, so I okay. can submit my comments via written feedback. Thank you, though. Okay, that, that would be great. No, no problem at all. Um, I, I guess I'll just so you're to give you that context. The last meeting we had some great speakers. Um, Dr. Sarah Vos uh, came from the Department of Health, talked about toxicity and human health impacts from PFAS uh, and other uh, polyfluorinated chemicals and microplastics. And then Brent Demers from uh, City Market came and presented on their practices in separating food waste from packaging and other other trash at the city market and their process for donation as well as the explorations in the animal feed and um, and compost and, and digestion and DPAC. So, um, but I won't rehash all of that. So, so then the group got into the, the charges and I think without uh, keeping you guys from discussing, let's go right into that. Um, we're happy to use, we can share the screen so that everybody can see the draft. Um, and maybe that's a starting point to engage with text. We might we're not have to wordsmith the whole thing, but let me just emphasize that um, getting your written comments to us are preferable so that we don't have to guess. I don't think it's in our charge to guess at what your recommendations might be, and that's where it gets dicey for us. So help us support you. With that, I'll turn it over to the group. Would you like us to share the yep. draft? Then okay. is that possible? Yep. You know who the three signals were from? Maybe it's written there, but uh, it'll be evident when we get okay. there. It was you, okay. um, Tom, and Steve Cash got them in actually late Friday, so they weren't involved. They didn't get into this draft until this morning when I got back. So um, there wasn't a whole lot to, to really get rolling on a draft with at the point in time late last week. So it's, it's a little bit uh, lacking. So this is the section conclusion and recommendations. This is where really kind of what we're talking about is above it. There's an executive summary and some rates and background stuff um, that we're going to fill in when we have more time to sit down and look at it. Um, so this is sort of the format we were looking at doing, as I mentioned before. Um, and some of this stuff might be able to get teased out of some of the comments and pulled into summary form uh, if there's more, you know, if there's more consistency in some of the messages that we're getting. But um, until everybody gets the submittals, in, it's kind of hard to tell. You mind zooming in a smidge? Sure. Let's see. Great. It's really big on my screen, but I guess it is smaller there. Is there a way to close this? So let me just say right out of the gate, like it is optional if we summarize, if there's, you know, points of commonality or points of contention. Um, you, you guys can decide if you just want the record to be your individual participant points of view, we can do that. Um, it's your it's your decision to make so. Well, it's hard without the other things uh, being in there, but I would think for readability's sake, it would be nice to have a summary of yep. the points for those points of overlap. So since uh, Genic may not be able to see this on the screen, you know, the charge first for the group is recommendations on whether the organics management hierarchy in 10 VSA 6605K should apply to each generator of organic waste. I think, and, and, and you guys can back me up or, or see what your perspectives are. Most people felt like it should apply to generators of organic waste. And there were, then things started to bifurcate on along lines a little bit more about enforcement versus a general uh, suggestion and then where that might even lie at bigger generator levels. I think there was some stuff from Dan that you would talked about along those lines. Um, but I think 
then we kind of summarize that there was some. And, and again, since we don't have everybody's comments yet, it's hard to it's hard to really summarize at this point. So this is open floor, Billy, Jenna, Aaron, anybody. Please speak up. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I guess. Go ahead. Go ahead, Billy. No, go ahead. I was going to say, in, in addition, I raised questions and will continue to about. The validity of the hierarchy. You know, we Vermont chose to go its own path and divert from the US EPA without scientific research data or evidence. It was based on opinion. And is that the path we're going to go down? Yep, valid point. And Billy, did you see? Uh, uh, I know Chris Beeling from EPA contacted you directly, but also in our uh, sort of the summary review notes that I sent out with all the new documents that were posted to the, the file directory. Um, I updated that with a, a more recent and more uh, thorough uh, overview from Chris Beeling about what EPA is doing and looking at doing to revise the hierarchy. Um, so they're kind of doing a, a broad study, including life cycle analysis, Billy, which I think is what you were talking about at our last meeting, um, and maybe at least open to the idea of teasing out some more of those tiers and maybe fine tuning some things. So. That's kind of ongoing. I think that's going to take longer than this group has. Um, I think it's going to be it's slated for sometime next year to be finished. But yeah, uh, public comment in the first quarter, I think. Right. Just I think the takeaway too. Go ahead, Jenna. Uh, I was just I don't I don't know the history behind why Vermont ad adopted the new hierarchy to begin with. Does anybody was anybody involved with that, or was there what was the rationale behind not going with the EPA hierarchy? Uh, the, the rationale was that the EPA hierarchy itself isn't really scientifically based and doesn't have a lot of uh, depth to it. And so the intent was to, and it's not actually wildly that different. There's a couple key parts to it that just essentially try to promote a more decentralized infrastructure to mitigate uh, both trucking, but also to maintain resources in the places where they're generated, like nutrients. And so again, think, not based on science. Well, no, there's there's like a lot of these things. It's not a complete picture, but we have a constellation of, of touch points. And so, for instance, with food production, we know more decentralized food production has a lower carbon footprint. So decentralization of infrastructure, especially things that are heavy and wet <clears throat> and also provide resources to mitigate other inputs like fertilizer. Um, yeah, there's a lot of science behind that. That's why it showed up there. Um, so I think actually the Vermont one is probably honestly more informed than the EPA one. And I think as part of EPA's process, they're looking at Vermont's right now. Um, so I don't know that we should be backing off from uh, stepping out front and being a little bit more ambitious. And to be clear, the only thing that are different between the two versions is Vermont's lumps together the industrial uses and the composting that EPA teases out. So that's that's really the difference between the two. So it's not a significant difference, but it is slightly different. Yeah, and, and Jenna, to further explain that, anaerobic digestion in the EPA's hierarchy is higher than compost. Um, and I think so is uh, uh, in the industrial uses of like- um, include rendering, rendering in, in that industrial yeah, use. Yeah, yeah. So, so rendering industry, um, which typically fat soils and grease and, and meat processing is what is thought of as rendering, um, is made into everything from animal feed to uh, Cosmetics, it's, uh, uh, tallow, and, and other other materials that go into fillers, um, and so those on the EPA hierarchy were higher than compost. Is the major difference, and in the and in the states, Vermont's is the same line. Compost and industrial uses and digestion are on the same line of the hierarchy. And so that means the, in the Vermont, other... it would be up to the person generating the waste whether they wanted to compost their waste or anaerobically digest or Right. It would be this the same level from a decision right. standpoint. Whether it, yeah, whether it's an enforceable hierarchy or whether it's a recommendation and a and a strong suggestion, um, the generator has equal option to those as it is currently in that as they're they're on the same level of the hierarchy. But I think the big question for us, right, is is it an enforcement thing or is it? And education, right? That's the question that the legislature is really asking. 
That's one, no, that's let, one idea that might be in there. <laughs> they only ask one question is, should it apply to everyone? I think that is a question. It was written to be enforced. It's now being treated as a menu of options. But, but right now it's not enforceable as it stands today, right? There's debate about that. I guess that's sort of why we're here, right? I mean, yeah, we, I mean agency yeah. has taken the stance, you know, that, uh, that it's a policy. And yeah. I think uh, Peter Blair, one of the earlier meetings sort of outlined the case that you know, maybe there's other ways to legally interpret that. So that's kind of I mean, yeah. the crux of why we're here in some ways. And Michael Grady had, at Ledge Council had given last legislative session and before some advice to the legislators on on the specific part. <clears throat> and if I, and if I recall his testimony, was that it's not directly enforceable, but maybe maybe that's not as direct as it could be. Like it. Like, I think Tom's right. There's some subject to interpretation, but his interpretation. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you get two different attorneys. Exactly. They, so, they, they you know, but again, I think I think more to the point is like they put the question in front of this group. And that's sort of what we were looking into um, when we research what other states are doing in terms of, uh, you yeah. know, do they have the hierarchy in their laws? Are they following it or are they doing something that's an alternative? And we sort of looked into other measures that could be put in place to increase voluntary compliance with food waste reduction and food donation and things like that. And that could be simply implemented uh, in lieu of enforcement. Cause like, I mean, we don't want to be out there kind of hammering people. We'd rather just people understand the need and the benefit of doing things um, and handle things the right way. So um, we'd certainly be open to kind of that approach if there's things that can be leveraged that, you know, bring about, um, Desired behaviors. I mean, I, I I stand more on the side of education, and I I would say that the hierarchy does have a place in the state, and I just evidence from what's happened since Act One Forty Eight went into effect. I mean, you probably know. The, I don't know the food donation and how much that increased. So that's all part of voluntary compliance that that happened, right? And that's part of our our comments. You'll see that I don't think enforcement is the way to go. I think education. If there's ways to make it easier to push people in those directions. I think it's great, but I think more education and, and not enforcing it right now, because there isn't enough science as well to kind of say, hey, which direction is the best? I mean, and I think you're, the state's gonna be doing some of those life cycle analysis as well. I think there's a couple things. One, we, we have lots of things that are technically enforceable, but on a statistical basis, we don't really enforce like taxes, you know? We still say that they're the, the baseline for how we need to operate, but we only actually enforce, pursue, audit, like, you know, the teeniest of fractions of things. And so it's the same thing with hunting licenses. It's the same thing with all sorts of things. It's not about policing it all the time. It's having the capacity to police it. And it's about the public messaging of this is the order in which you're expected to do things. It's not going to be the agency having, you know, badged, officials going out and doing, you know, searches constantly. Um, so I think it's just, you know, we, we don't enforce every law we have, but we have the laws there to, to create a container for society that establishes that clarity. And, you know, right now, food donations have gone up. But for instance, like there's still a huge lack of infrastructure to meet the need for the emergency food system and food recovery. And right now it's entirely funded through charity. But with something like the hierarchy, we can actually spur more private investment in those spaces by, you know, like you've been asking for, and I agree with, <clears throat> you know, having more clarity. So if we define where that market is, people will come in to fill it eventually. Um, so I think like the enforcement thing is kind of like the wrong framing in that it's more about like establishing really clear priorities that could be enforceable. <laughs> like the enforcement is the secondary part of it. Um, and I think the other part is like, I really hope that this group and that and my hope through our visioning process was to really establish like a clarity about the moment in time that we're in and that ideas like optional participation, voluntary participation that we have sort of entertained in the past really may not, um, be relevant any longer. Um, I think we need to be a little bit more clear eyed that sort of these voluntary compliance approaches have not worked by and large. Like they have some effect, but not maximum effect. And I think we're needing maximum effect. And we can kick every single question down the road for more science, but I think on a gut level, recovering food for people who are food insecure 
is the first order of business, regardless of the science. There's a dignity issue. What's that? Sorry, I don't want to interrupt. Keep going, but I would I'd like to follow up with with a couple of things. Sorry, Tom, I didn't mean to interrupt. I'll, I can come back to it. Go ahead. I just I can appreciate the idealistic view that everybody should um, uh, follow the rules exactly, but we also need to li live. We also live in a realistic world where even even though somebody some company decides that they're going to give food to a food shelf doesn't mean that that food should have been given to the food shelf and now the food shelf let's say is on the hook for managing that waste as well so just because we expect people to follow the rules it doesn't mean that that the rules the rules are meant for an idealistic society i feel like that's where we're headed right now and we need to understand the real world impacts on enforcement and this system that is set up right now for again a, an idealistic society um the other thing I, we need to i think acknowledge is different organizations, different companies have been told different iterations of this hierarchy. So I think clarifying what what we're supposed to be looking at the, the hierarchy for would be helpful. Is it um, starting at the top and going down every level? Or is it just if you're doing one thing on the hierarchy, then that's acceptable? Because there's there is differing messaging out there for again for businesses and organizations on that level again i appreciate the idealistic view but we don't live in an idealistic society we live in reality and we need to understand that it's never going to be perfect so what is the best way to move forward within a realistic system could you unpack that a little bit more? I don't know that I actually am understanding sort of the what the what the framework is that you're presenting. You were just talking about setting rules and everybody needs to follow those rules exactly. But if there are different interpretation interpretations of the hierarchy being shared with different businesses or organizations, then that's already no, no, no. The, 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 for, the first part about the rules. I get the the interpretation thing. I think like Josh just said, that's what we're here to help do. But more in terms of the applying the rules part, like uh, and and the difference between the idealistic framework you're talking about and the reality framework. Uh, well, you just said yourself, Tom, that that there's not capacity to enforce all of it, right? So yeah, the, I guess that's my point is that, you know, I don't think we need to worry about 100 percent effectiveness at every angle. But if we hit 85 percent, wow, we would be doing great, you know. So <clears throat> we don't expect to we you know, we we it's idealistic to expect people to pay their taxes. We don't enforce that all the time, but we hold the capacity to do that. And most people comply. I got a question from you from the, the report writing standpoint for everybody. Um, I would think it would be helpful for me. Uh, and try to pull the report together. If you were thinking about those levers of what would we need to pull to get the best sort of balance of um, compliance with the hierarchy, and maybe it sounds like everyone says the enforcement is not the preferred angle, but it's nice to have it in the back pocket if necessary. Um, but sort of which levers do we got to pull to get that sweet spot? I think that would be helpful for context in the report. If folks can think through that lens when when writing the comments to send in, that would be helpful for me. <clears throat> Well, I, I'm seeing the disagreement here, and and it's it's clear. And there's there's some from Billy raised some stuff about his uh, questions about the hierarchy being different from EPA. Aaron's raising some stuff. Tom, you've got a different perspective. Dan, I'm curious about some of the comments you had because you led off last time on this topic, and I don't think Jenna got to hear that. And I'm trying to remember what your perspective was because it was somewhere on this topic. It was in the spectrum. So I just thought it, there was an interesting thing. I can't remember asking you about where. Yeah, you're. well, I'm, I'm, I'm finding the conversation very interesting. It sounds like uh, there's um, desire for maybe a weakening of the rules because the rules are already. I mean, the hierarchy exists, and I, I'm hearing from Billy that he would like it not to be there, or that he would like it to be the national version, but the EPA version. But 
it's there. And I think the question is, are we applying it to each generator? And so my comments on it were that, yes, we should apply it to each generator as was written and recognizing that we're not going to be able to enforce it, uh, that we're not going to hit 100 percent, but without clarity, then why bother at all? You know, like to Tom's point, we, we have rules and those are sometimes more ambitious than others because of our ability to enforce, but without them, uh, we don't, we're not going to get anywhere. You know, like, I think, so my points were basically, yes, yes, it should be applied to everyone and acknowledging that we have limited resources for enforcement, we should uh, continue to focus those on the highest level of generators. So either borrowing from the California models that were brought up um, from Ben and and A&R staff when they put together their piece uh, a couple months ago or other or through other mechanisms I think yes it should we should enforce it um, at the highest level and and have real clear messaging that it is still a hierarchy even if we're not going to necessarily have the ability to enforce that at a residential level at small generator level but yes it's it is a law uh, and and we believe in that law for for these reasons, you know, not that you'd spell that all out, but that's that our thinking and the people who wrote the legislation put it in there for a reason. Yeah. And and for context, we, we may not all agree, but I want to say that um, there's 30 minutes you guys allocated to each one. Like that was what we talked about last time. I think Dan, you suggested this agenda framework that we have. And so I don't want to like necessarily beat the dead horse if people aren't going to come to agreement on everything. But I think um, we're spending I, for for Jenna especially, this is a time to spend on this issue and it's productive time or as productive as we can make it. And Dan, you just put some things out there. Mike had suggested education. Um, is there any commonality or meet in the middle or I don't know, is there like uh, kind of the Ben's point, is there anything that um, you agree with in Dan's statements or not, I guess? I would say the, the large generators, most of the ones that we, we deal with, I feel like in Vermont, they, they do do the right thing. And I would say that we have 95 to 99 to 100% compliance with those large generators. I mean, maybe not that they're going to go to this compost operation or that compost. They may want to do deep pack and mix materials, whatever it may be, yeah. but they are all complying with the intent. I'd say so you're saying some there's some food donation or some the, yeah they're they're doing waste reduction because yeah, right. it meets their own bottom the large line. generators they're not doing the no like they're over there where even the ones that have options for live feeding livestock uh, aren't necessarily using that so that's where there is a, actually a break in it um so i think the food donation piece is happening not at to the graded like the complete extent yep um because picking up totes i can tell you there's plenty of edible food in there, good like fruit. But no, we're like skipping. We are skipping through the steps and going to sort of lower points on the hierarchy before completing the hierarchy, I think, in most of those cases. Anyway, Mike, you were, <clears throat> I, I, what I heard you saying also, just to kind of piece that out, is that most of the customers you have served for trash for years are doing something. Um, that's maybe to Tom's point, I think Thomas' point as well. But can you keep going on your side. I'm just saying that the, the large generators, from my standpoint, are actually doing a really great job at following the law or trying to get through that. I'd say as you go further down the chain to the smaller, um, like residential complexes, and they're the ones that aren't really as uh, embracing the law as it's written, right? So I would say that that's more where that enforcement may or may not help or more education. I would say more education on those lower level tiers. Mike, do you, would you say that the, the folks in your experience are doing a good job um, diverting organics or a good job uh, following the hierarchy? Or can you tell if they're following the hierarchy? I, I think that that's, once again, that, that's the hard piece because there is like, right when you get into feeding animals, right? And I'm, there's a lot of liability and a lot of risk that goes with that as well. So. You know, a lot of companies are going to say, I'd rather have to go to a compost yard or I'd rather have to go to um, an anaerobic digestion because there is the potential for contamination or other things that get in there that could hurt livestock or hurt, you know, so there's a whole sense of um, sensitivity around that, I would say, just from they don't want to I, do more harm. I would say, too, like, exactly well, what Mike is saying. 
working for Ben and Jerry's, we are extremely sensitive to where our product goes um, and also where our packaging ends up because our branded image, um, you know, is a liability um, where it ends up in the environment. So I completely agree with Mike. Yeah, and speaking anecdotally, I mean, we have partners who have diverted waste to anaerobic digestion for that reason because they can't be 100% sure that there isn't some level of contamination that could harm livestock. And without a process that somebody pays for to mitigate that risk, they're choosing the best possible option with the lowest possible risk. I, I think the hierarchy like doesn't mean you have to put yourself at risk. Like if you if your food is or is not appropriate for one item, then you go to the next tier on the hierarchy. So I don't think there's any like insistence that food like spent ice cream or whatever has to go to one use or another. It's it's the you, you go to the most the highest, most appropriate use and built into it is the assumption that not everything can go to the top. Sometimes you work your way down. So if it's not appropriate, if if people doing food rescue don't feel like it's safe or you can't hit the standards for food rescue, then you go to the next tier down from it. You're not required to send them bad food. Um, same thing with livestock and the livestock growers themselves are assuming a liability and also wanting to be self-protective. And so they're going to be cautious along the way. I, I, I don't think it's like quite as uh, like mandated as it's being described right now. I think it's like a flow chart. It's like a yes, no, go to the next level, create your own mystery. Well, yes and no, because again, I've heard from from generators that, you know, it it is that prescriptive. I've heard both sides. I've heard genera generators who have said it is very prescriptive, who said I have to do X, Y, and Z, and I have to prove that I, you know, tried to start at the top and work my way down. So what operationally, what does that look like? But then I've also heard generators who have said, no, it's it's the highest and best use. Um, so I think there needs to be clarity on on what the hierarchy actually is or how to follow it. Um, but also, again, operationally, what am I going to have to prove to show that I'm I'm going to the highest and best use? I wonder if like ANR staff could offer some input on just that piece about like you have to do the, you know, like. Well, yeah, and I mean, I think we, we started tiptoeing around that when you guys said, what are your ideas, agency? And we put together that draft and and that included, let me just say there's two stakeholder groups who are not uh, uh, charged with coming to the table here and that's the food rescue people don't have a representative here. And I'm just aware of that because we've been talking around it, but we don't have them in the room, which is ironic. And, uh, and we also don't have, um, Steve Cash is not here today, which connects to animal feed but um, Tom, you are the representative for that. But there's, um, it's something we've we, we've identified in that draft two areas of possible leverage point. I don't know what you want to call it. Um, action around food donation on the hierarchy and how to support that and animal feed basically. And using Cal I think it was California as a model. I'm looking at Ben to remind me if I got that yeah. right. Yeah. Um, and so they and they they. It, you know, we've talked about willing and able is a comment that I brought up and we've used that as a framework um, or a, 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 an ad hoc um, term to, to be a beginning building block for framework ideas. Um, but the, there is a lot of, I think there's some good points about devils in the details. I have been in conversations with quality assurance officers at industrial companies like Ben and Jerry's who said, our, you know, we, we can't assure the 100% uh, cleanliness of this. We could put in a $100,000 infrastructure to make sure, but we just don't have that capacity to do that. This was in the case of a dairy product that had been going to pig feed away product and, and it stopped. Um, Agency of Ag was involved in that as well because both of us were looking at different options, getting calls. Um, but I just go ahead, Ben. I, I'm aware that some of those stakeholders aren't here today and they would have good. Yeah, I was just going to add to a lot of the thoughts that people had already mentioned so far and, and the difficulty that I have from a regulatory standpoint uh, when it comes to the hierarchy is it's difficult from our desk here in Montpelier to tell if someone has gone through, you know, is this suitable for this? 
have I made a good effort at, at, at determining if there's somebody locally that can meet this need? If not, go to the next one. So it makes it really difficult from an enforcement standpoint to be able to do that kind of work. Um, I, I like the idea that Dan had mentioned about, you know, maybe having a, a larger generator tier or something where we work more actively with those folks, uh, both from an educational and guidance standpoint, and then also require a little bit of tracking to be able to say, hey, it doesn't look like you're making a, you know, this effort as well as you ought to. Let's try to bump that up. Um, but it's really it's notoriously difficult from a regulatory standpoint, um, the way I look at it. So if there's if we want to go that route as the group recommendation, it would be helpful to have some thoughts on how we can flesh that out. But just but in terms of that piece of like you must donate that ice cream to or way <clears throat> to pigs or not donate it, whatever that send it. Send it. <laughs> like you're right. Wouldn't wouldn't you would you would you as as the regulators at this point feel that Ben and Jerry's right now by law has to do it. Even if, you know, if they're telling a pig farmer like, hey, we can't ensure this is clean, nobody's going to want to take it anyway. So they, there's no willing and able. So they would bump to the next tier down just by nature of this, right? Like I, I'm not overlooking it, the gray areas, no, but I, I'm just in concept. Like, I get it. I think it gets a little, I think it gets a little sticky because um, let's say you have a process where you take in food waste and, and have chickens have access to the compost product and others might not be comfortable with that, but you're comfortable with that. And so you're trying to convince the generator that you've got this higher and better use of animal feed, right? And then you've got agency of ag who regulates it and they're, but you've got to look at their regulations. And so it, it Wait, but their regulations fit in, and if it doesn't fit into those regulations, it's not an option. Right, right. right. So that could be the checks and balances. We, I mean, isn't that sister agencies defer to each other all the time with oversight and say if they approve it, then yeah. Um, I mean, we have it written in the law. Yeah, I, I just was. I guess I was trying to suggest that where it gets a little murky is where the person wanting the market, whatever type of market you're thinking about, whether it's free and given, and they want it because it offsets feed costs, or they're paying for it, or they're getting paid to take it. It's all a market. Um, it does, the, the person advocating to get the material um, could have differences of opinion on it and be fighting for their, their rights on the hierarchy that are different from the state law or the regulation um, and or where the generator wants. It's just complicated. That's all I'm suggesting. And, and I could see that happening. I mean, I see it in the recycling industry all the time too, right? Where we might not take something to an outlet because we do our own due diligence and say something doesn't check out, right? Not to say that that's your facility, but there could be other compost facilities that pop up and I go and do a, an environmental audit before I bring any material there. And I'm like, yeah, they might be higher on the hierarchy, but I'm not going to bring material there because I'm not going to put Casella's name on that outlet, right? And sure. Then someone could come back and we get into a big dispute or lawsuits over, hey, we didn't want to bring material there because of X, Y, Z. And that could take 10 years to vet out. And we've had those those things happen before. So yeah, I think that's ben another big thing. That, sorry, Ben and Jerry's had the same thing happen too, where we used to um, send ice cream for animal feed and we've gotten into, you know, media storms around, you know, that runoffs and things like that from residuals and on land application and things like that. Um, and also it, it just takes a lot knowing, you know, for, for feed, animal feed, for example, you know, the, the producers around here are, are not large compared to the amount of food waste that we generate. And so it's, it's a lot of management and sh trucking and running around um, versus something that could have a, a cleaner, I guess, more elegant solution without all that, which is kind of what Billy was getting to before, I think, looking at the whole environmental impact. So it's 1015. Um, I, I see people have some differences of opinion, which is expected in this group. Um, we, we are dedicating about a half an hour per topic. Um, should we keep going? Should we move on? What would you like to do? We could go until the half hour on this issue and see if there's any other commonalities. Any other? I was going to suggest we kind of move on to the next two items. I know there's a reservation in this room directly after this meeting, so okay. we don't have any. So we have 1130. Yeah, 1130. Okay. That not showing. Can folks see that screen? Or is it black? 
No, I see it. It's black yeah, for me. I can see it. Weird. Right, Seven on the last call. Are you are you showing that document that you put in the chat? Yeah, I was trying to share that. It's showing up on my screen like I'm sharing it. It's just not appearing on the room. Well, are you um, are you just on page eight where it says number two? Whether the I was agency gonna, of yeah that yeah I was gonna go to number two and just start kick off that conversation. Maybe we can just do okay. that each on our own. I guess. Um, as people are reading, I, I want to bring up a resource that I asked Ben to put on the website. Um, and this is a this is the definition of food waste and what is considered a food waste that's banned and, and how does the agency approach that issue? And it's highly complicated. But I do think that going through that that difficult exercise and drafting that guidance document was helpful. Um, and I think it's almost like a. Like we asked for extra guidance on this stuff. It's a model of trying to get there. Um, it's not perfect. It could still use work. It probably will evolve, should evolve. Um, we can we can share that as well in this conversation and context. I, I just wanted to make sure that I think Mike's aware of it. We were working with Trevor Mance at the time when, uh, when he had all these different ways and Karen Flanders had it. Um, it was helpful to to bounce different scenarios off of uh, different waste materials and where they would fit and what would be contaminated and, and what willing and able might look like. <clears throat> so. Uh, and I'll see if I can join and then maybe I can even share screens. Yeah, this is maddening. I'm not sure what's happening. Yeah, I just see a black black screen. Well, I guess that ain't going to work. <laughs> Maybe if we can just all uh, scroll to that page and take a look and kick off that conversation. I don't know how else to do it. Page. I might it's page, sure, then. It's, uh, page eight of the Word document. Oh, the draft. The draft, yeah. So weird. Do you have it open from the Y drive or do you have it open from, um, uh, from the website? Probably both at this point. A bunch of different ways. They're they're the same document though, so yeah. you can pick either. I guess while we're waiting for this, just you know, I think as we try to draft the report, we should just make sure that we're really explicitly answering the questions we've been asked, and the the kind of creeping nature of the scope here. I think if we do that, I think we might find more consensus. You know, um, but if we start opening everything up, um, one we're doing something that we weren't asked to do and two we're going to just have a harder time kind of writing anything that's cohesive um so maybe like just really clarifying on that depackaging issue the question is who is it applying to i think that's really the question we're being asked as a group not should it exist in any of these other parts <clears throat> you mean on the hierarchy issue on the hierarchy issue. okay so, yeah said so you said depackaging just confused. sorry thank you no worries what page are you on, Ben? Uh, page eight of the Word document. All right, let me see if I can share. Maybe it'll ask you for some section. Yeah, just. Uh... All right, you have to. Uh... Thank you. Thank you. Telling you there's some weird stuff going on right now. This firewall stuff. I think Jenna was running into this issue before. Has some weird hiccups that we haven't seen before that are just popping up in the last couple of weeks. Well, sorry for folks listening on and that we can't share screens on this. This is really frustrating. Um, yeah, technologically, I am stumped. The chums here. Um, you know, uh, well, for the folks in the room, you could minimize Teams and share it that way because your screen is up there. And is it, has it been shared in the comments on there so people could see it's it? In the public comments. Yeah. Great. It's both in the comments. Um, I'll, po I'll post it again in the comments. Or in the chat section. The chat. Yeah. 
Well, we're on number two. Uh, go ahead. Sorry. The document oh, just showed up. It just showed up in the window. Maybe I can see it a really long time. time. Yeah, but okay. we can't see it here. <laughs> I can see Aaron, it. can you see it? Yeah. All right. For some reason it's not showing up in the room. It just showed up in the last 20 um, seconds. All right. All right, well, um, the item we're talking about is number two, whether the Agency of Natural Resources should modify its existing policy surrounding the source separation of organic waste. Yeah, who wants to start for discussion? Would you like me to go through our policy and? Um, <clears throat> would it be good to just review the le how it reads right now in in law as sure. a starting point? Sure. With the definitions and stuff. Um, so in the state statute um, amended by the Universal Recycling Law Act 148 of 2012, source separated and source separation means the separation of compostable and recyclable materials from non-compostable, non-recyclable materials at the point of generation. And food residual above that means source separated and uncontaminated material that is derived from the processing or discarding of food that is recyclable in a manner consistent with section 6605K, which is the hierarchy of this title. And then it goes on, food residual may, be, may include pre-consumer, post-consumer food scraps, and food residual does not mean meat and meat-related products when composted at a resident, uh, at, by a resident on site. And then... Where, where is this written? You, you were speaking kind of fast. That's on the website? It's in... Um, I can post a link, Jenna, in the chat. Yeah, Jenna, these okay. are definitions from state statute that were amended. Um, so I can give you the statutory reference, but also we can put it on Thanks. Um, on the website. For folks, it, it's statutory reference is 10 BSA section 6602 definitions. And those are a lot of solid waste definitions. Um, and they were added, Those uh, that section of definitions was added to as part of the universal recycling law. Oh, there it is. And what I'll do is I'll uh, we prepared a document earlier on um, at the hierarchy meeting that we had that has all this kind of pulled out of various statutes and, and hyperlinked. Um, so I'll post that document in the chat for everybody. And then further, the, the part of the universal recycling law that applies to generators is 10 VSA 6605K, um, which has which starts with the food residual management hierarchy. And then after the hierarchy, uh, which, uh, yeah, by the way, the hierarchy says it is the policy of the state that food residuals collected under the requirements of this chapter shall be managed according to the following order of priority uses. And then it goes through reduction at the source, diversion for people, diversion for animals and agricultural uses, uh, composting, land application and digestion, and then last was energy recovery. Uh, and then it says a person, and this has been a conversation in this group a lot, and can we define a generator? So it says a person who produces more than an amount identified. This is my old version of Act 148. Um, Mike O'Grady did fix this because it had the 20 mile reference, which was phased out after the 2020 full landfill ban went into effect. But a person that produces an amount um, identified under this section of food residuals and must, yeah, blah, 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 shall separate food residuals from other solid waste, provided that a de minimis amount of food residuals may be disposed of in solid waste when a person has established a program to separate food residuals. And the program includes a component for the education of program users regarding the need to separate food residuals. So that's a lot, and I don't have it on the screen, so that's probably not helping anybody. <laughs> um, I think I'll, I'll stop talking in a minute on this one. I think um, there is, in as this group has heard 
discussions from from attorneys like Matt Chapman, former attorneys like Matt Chapman, and, and attorneys. Um, uh, I'm forgetting Peter, his name. Peter Blair. Peter, Peter Blair. Thank you. Uh, attorneys like Peter Blair have taken different approaches. Um, there is standing definitions, as Thomas referred to in statute, on source separation at the point of generation, and the agency had to think about how to apply this as and put out a policy document that essentially um, permits the commingling of packaged and unpackaged food, and that is a subject of uh, concern among some and and has been spoken about the legislature and is the crux of an issue in front of this group. Um, so if you need any more background, let me know. I'm happy to go into more detail. And I can reiterate what I've already submitted. I'm wondering if uh, Billy and um, Aaron or Mike, if you had, are you intending to submit comments to this? Mike's came in. Yeah. Oh, Mike's came in. Okay. Billy and Aaron. Yes. Yes, we are. So I guess just to kick it off, um, you know, my feeling is from a just from a simplicity and clarity standpoint that the state needs sort of one overarching policy, and then from that you can create exceptions or exemptions um, that are are couched within the larger policy. But I don't think you can have sort of two competing competing points on the horizon for the framework. Um, so. I think the idea of prioritizing source separation is that it it creates the, the optimum conditions for all of the different points on the hierarchy. Um, and so where when we're looking at the state and it's in the entire entire um, portfolio of options, having the um, the baseline be source separation keeps all of those options open and does the most for mitigating contamination, pollution, et cetera. And I think then there are opportunities to create exemptions within that, say for depackaging in appropriate places, but um, that it falls within, in my mind, it should fall within that overarching framework so that um, it's not entirely decoupled um, and we don't have just widespread confusion about separation at all, you know. Um, so I think there's a simplicity in sticking with the law, but uh, but amending it to be um, to have more exceptions and exemptions within it to create a little bit more practical flexibility for very specific material streams. Here, so uh, this this is Dan Goosen's um, submitted. Boy, this is slow. I scroll, it takes forever to react on the screen. Um, yeah, there's like a long train for this whole thing. Um, Steve Cash has also submitted comments on this topic. Uh, the Agency of Natural Resources should change its policies surrounding source separation so that it does not allow food residuals to be managed by commingling packaging and unpackaged food waste. Piece number two is a definition. A separate definition should be created for food residuals that have been processed and depackaging equipment. This material is not uncontaminated and does not align with the definition of a food residual. Number three, if the policies around source separation are not changed, uh, the output of depackaging equipment should be managed as a solid waste by NR, including sampling from microplastic PFAS and PFAS prior to export. 
The application of the output waste should be regulated under a residuals management program and records of land application date, rate, and contents, nutrients, PFAS, and mycoplastic content should be collected and monitored. Land used for depackage or waste management should not be used to grow food feed without sufficient testing and management practice in place to ensure it is safe to do so. Okay, so those are the, and Mike, I don't know if you want to comment on your comments yet. I don't have them in the document. Oh, you did catch up. No, I mean, our, our comments are just, I mean, without the lack of research and understanding on some of these things, it's, it's tough to say which direction to go on. I think one of the other pieces for me would be clarity and, you know, what is defined as source separation. One of the things that we run into as a hauler is even at the organics facilities, some accept some products and not other products. So, you know, bio bags being the big one. So I can't take some of our compost to certain locations right now because bio bags are included at some facilities and not others. So I'm kind of want to make it more of a overarching source separation means this and we get rid of bio bags and say this is what it may be right and I, I think that's just a discussion maybe that's not kind of the charge of the, the group but at the same point in time yeah talking about it so i mean bio bags could be considered as something that's not a food residual so it's a, it doesn't seem like an unreasonable question on the source separation part yeah we certainly don't tell people that they have to throw napkins in or bio bags are not banned and go away. And napkins are not banned and they can go away. Yep. We've, been, we've answered those questions before. I can make an observation. It seems like um, the folks who are currently accepting the co-mingled stuff or part of that system would like that to continue perhaps, whereas those, uh, we've heard other voices, including my own, that would say that co-mingling uh, shouldn't be allowed so that you can maintain the options. Um, I'm just curious conceptually if, uh, if everybody in this group um, would agree perhaps just in, in terms of, of putting this report together, if indeed there's recognition that um, by maintaining what we call source separation, by maintaining the quality of that material that it does indeed allow for all the options on the hierarchy, like is that a point of agreement? regardless of whether it's not whether whether or not you want that to be the final outcome is that does that make sense to other folks because to me that seems like pretty baseline um point in all of this is like source separation for me means that you have more options for what happens to that uh end stream material whether or not it's achievable from your perspective um or efficient or does it would folks agree that if you can keep packaging out of food waste, um, that that indeed increases the amount, the likelihood of being able to feed people, feed animals, uh, big soil, and uh, perhaps even more options for digested, um, digestate the tail end of that process? I'll, I'll just reiterate a comment that I made several meetings ago. and. And that is, you, without looking at this holistically, you're not taking into consideration the the impact that these decisions have on systems outside of just the linear path from food waste to compost. So, you know, we had this conversation about price and cost and value, and putting a price on organics is not the same as putting a value on it. And I push that back again. You know, the, the climate impact from putting material on the ground and letting it off gas is pretty significant compared to capturing that gas and repurposing it. So I have, I, I don't agree totally that that's the, that's the direction because you're not taking into consideration all the possible outcomes from taking that material and moving it from one point, point to another. So I'm hearing a, an argument for perhaps um, for turning food waste into gas rather than compost, I think is what you're referring to, but or land applied food directly. But in terms of options, like maintaining the most uh, options, would you agree that like keeping packaging separate from food waste 
um, that might not need to be depackaged? With, does that indeed ensure the most, the widest range of options for all the different potential points of disposal or reuse or? Uncontaminated organics are preferred. Okay, great. I will note one of the one of the things which I'm not being cute, but uh, Brent Demir said packaged food went to donation because he kept because it kept in his packaging to contain its life. That's a different thing, but there are instances where you keep it packaged to get it to food rescue sites so they can use it quickly. Yeah, absolutely. but there's also food rescue sites that get too much dairy that's right close to its end of life, and then and then what do they do? Yeah, which we've heard about as well. I, I guess just to ha ask testing questions, you know, one sort of along the lines that Dan is is asking about, um, is is it something that we can agree on that um, that in order for the state to be successful with the law in general, there needs to be that clarity that sort of says here is the singular frame. You froze. I, don't, I lost the audio. Yeah, me too. Me too. Mm -hmm. I can hear you though, Aaron. Yeah, the image is frozen and there's no audio. Yeah. I can hear Aaron and whoever else was that. Jenna. I think we lost Jenna. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um. Does anybody know a text number of somebody in the room? I just raised my hand. I don't know if you guys can hear me. Yeah, maybe. Oh, yeah. Will... yeah, maybe yeah, someone can see the hand raised. Raise. I'll text Josh and see if. Yeah. Are they totally gone now? I they're think gone. they're probably they're probably going to rejoin. Yeah. They're rejoining. Mike Casella just texted me and said that they're trying to get back on.
It's not gonna, I can't adjust this at least for the. Yeah, is there a way to mainline in that monitor, I wonder? Uh, here's we'll something. Have to change the monitors in that source. If we can, get we can hear you now, Josh. Did you join as a... Aaron, can you hear us? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yeah. Yeah, hang on. I got my speakers turned off. I got everything turned off. Okay, go ahead, Aaron. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, so the internet, uh, state of Vermont internet uh, in the National Life just crashed, like the whole thing. Oh, yeah. no. So that's what it is. So now I'm on the state of Vermont public internet. Um, IT is working on the issue, but um, our mega screen that we normally use is um, obviously not using that Wi-Fi. So unless I can figure out how to troubleshoot that, I think we have access to that. That I might call the IT back on for for now. Um, but for now, I'll unplug my laptop, turn up the volume. I don't know if it's still it's recording true, it's or still not. Recording. I think it is. It's it says it's recording still. Yeah, we had this happen at another public meeting yeah. once where it went down early and still recorded. <laughs> so hopefully no one said anything. <laughs> oh, <you're off>. <laughs> <laughs> Stupid Nobody thing. did. <laughs> All right, so you're kind of back. Um, you're going to have to people in the room are going to have to speak loud so the laptop speakers hear you or Ben can repeat it. I'm going to call IT and see if they can get that thing back on. Great. Did you guys figure it all out when we were, I mean, uh, number two? So I think I think where we left off, Tom, you, you were asking a question. I was just simply, uh, yeah, testing the idea of like, do we agree that sort of one unified policy with ex exemptions within it is necessary for clarity for the, the markets, for businesses, for generators, for haulers, um, versus having sort of two parallel systems that are not integrated? Like source separation is a hard thing to just say, like, if you want source separate, because it's there's no market incentive to do a good job in that case. You know, there's no added sort of like market to tap that like the organic market or something like that. Um, so it, it it's one of those things that has to be. Um, you know, to, to some extent mandated um, and it's hard to mandate something when you have a parallel system. Um, rather than embedding that parallel system in as an exemption. I don't know. I don't know. I guess I would have to flesh it out. I'm just thinking operationally. How prescriptive are those. Rules for specific industry or you know, like you were saying, the market or the, yeah, the market, the generator, et cetera. Um, I don't know if more rules are necessarily clearer. I'd have to think about that operationally. I don't know about what others would think. Yeah, I'm not, I'm actually, it's not more rules. It's like source separation is the law right now. Uh, and so then the question is sort of like how to how to frame like like structurally for a, say a messaging standpoint like it's you you kind of need one message to put out there but haven't we had one message um what we did until there was some uh, reinterpretation that sort of created this uh, parallel reality that's not integrated into the law. Can, can you be more explicit what that means? I'm not following what this parallel system. Yeah, is. I don't know what a parallel reality is. So in the laws, Josh just read uh, source separation is mandated. Um, then when depackaging became allowed, um, Matt Chapman sort of did some legal yoga and came up with an interpretation that said, 
Well, when you when it says compostable materials and recyclable materials in the same sentence, it means that those two materials don't need to be separated, but that they can be. They just can't be blended with other solid waste, which is an improbable. Concept to defend because one, no other state in the country would interpret it that way. Other states have explicitly, for instance, exempted depacking from source separation. Um, and if we were putting organics into the recycling stream, it would totally gum up the MRF. And so the idea of commingling organics and recycling just doesn't, it's not consistent with the way the law reads right now. So right now we have this very confusing framework where we've allowed depackaging, but it doesn't really fit into the law. And so it's this sort of parallel thing. And then it turns into a um, like this co-blending of, of packaged and unpackaged materials. There's no clear guidance around it. If you if you go back to the original law, you create that overarching framework that says, you know, source separation is the is the mandate. But like many other laws, there are exemptions within that that would qualify for doing something. Other than that, um, then it's a unified message and people understand where a different practice fits in in the context of being an exemption as opposed to a totally parallel system. So it's very hard to have these two opposite things. I think at the last meeting I shared the experience of having somebody who worked at a, a grocery store, previously had to sort of separate there. They went to depackaging, but then at her home, she was confused about whether she had to sort of separate still or whether she could just add like everything packaged into the container. So it creates this very like, uh, it creates more complexity rather than simplicity. Yeah, and, and I'll I'll jump in, um, Jenna. I'm trying to put my head on the screen a little bit. Um, just to, I mean, the way statute has source separation at the point of generation would be very very difficult for a tractor trailer load of Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Not to put you know enough put Ben and Jerry's on that point. And I think I think Tom and Dan, who are proponents of of depackaging in the right place, also understand that that situation. I, I, I remember in conversations with Tom, this goes back years ago now on this issue where you were saying, you know, you turned away Cabot product of that tractor trailer load because it was like cottage cheese and it was whatever it was, um, you yeah, know, eight ounce containers, eight ounce containers of whatever sour cream and, you know, of truckload size. And it's just no, no capacity to take that out, even as it might have such animal feed value. So I think where the law is clear is it does say at point of generation, it's in a definition. If it was to be crystal clear from an implementation standpoint on enforcement, I think it would say every generator shall do this. And I think legal people can pick it apart. And Tom will say, and I think rightly so, there's another alternative that it already says that. And then, but where does that leave that tractor trailer load? Does that mean that it, 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 that if I own that tractor trailer, it's at the back of my warehouse, my manufacturing, that I need to have a people to manually do that? Can I use a machine? Can I use my machine? Or can I outsource that? And then... Uh, and that would be the exemptions that I'm talking about, is to create space for that. Right, right. And so I think that's the conversation we're having. And, and the, um, the agency's guidance on our website and our materials has been to remove contamination from food waste. Um, and try, same with recycling to try and have recycle right and, and recycle like you live here campaigns that are structured at getting the right things recycled and not the bad things. Um, when you look at a full food waste ban, you end up with materials that are really challenging. Um, and so I've always described it as pressure relief valves for like the minimus law clause is a part of that pressure relief valve we talked about here. Um, the definitions that say it's a food waste if it is acceptable for recyclable as according to these uses. Uses use that the, you all use. Yeah. Hang on a second. Hang on a second. Okay. All right, All right now. now. <laughs> All right now. Yes, Aaron, is it okay? 
You're good. You're better now. No echoes. Man, I thought it was that boy slim there for a second. Good job. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, James, so much. I don't know. Uh, so you don't need my laptop anymore. No. Well, what what camera are we using? Well, that's, that's your laptop. It's your laptop. It's your laptop. Oh. All right. So let me turn off my camera. So back to what I was saying, I, I guess I was just trying to unpack, no pun intended, the difficulties and the areas around this. And, um, I, you know, I do feel like the message has been source separation to most of the audience when it comes down to the Universal Recycling Stakeholders Group and some real core crux of issue, tough points uh, where the agency has fallen in the policy is to allow commingling of packaged and unpackaged. And that has some outcomes that people are wrestling with here that you're all talking about. Here. But the message for that worker in a grocery store yep, is confusing. nobody's clarifying it for them. So the framework I'm proposing that has the exemption for depackaging built in means that basically the state would be presenting or the business in that case, you know, generally source separation is the law of the land. In this case, we're allowing for this specific yeah. way to manage this stream of material but it's a it's a it's an isolated uh discrete function it's not a parallel system and i think that's the piece that i'm trying to point out is from a messaging standpoint that gets sloppy really fast yeah um this is getting more you know there are folks operating depackaging systems that are now bidding on different types of of contracts so including like recycling centers so suddenly now we could have some recycling centers where you're you don't have to source separate. You can bring your packaged food there potentially. Like if if source separation isn't the game, what is the game? Because it, it it sort of turns into the wild west at that point. And then suddenly there's no uniformity throughout the state, mm -hmm. and we've totally lost our ability to sort of drive towards a clean end product. And I think one thing that even despite the disagreements on the hierarchy or the source separation that have emerged over the last 10 years, all of us at the table building this law were dedicated to creating the highest value, cleanest system that Vermont could sustain um, and be really proud of and not have it full of trash. Um, and that just starts getting really complex the minute you don't have one sort of uh, um, unifying framework. Yeah, and I, I'm encouraged. I, I don't want to take up too much of my own your time with me talking, but someone like Jenna, who's representing industry, has tractor trailer loads, which are unlikely to come to you. Um, could have in, in some past gone to Green Mountain and been prior to that the Intervale, but it's not always effective given liquids and all that stuff. But uh, I guess what I'm saying is there is still room in what you're saying for depackaging. Absolutely. And even with with what Dan was saying, the question is where's the line. And I think there could be benefit to clarifying that for the agency if if there's changes to be made. So, you know, there is room for help. We didn't get into that in the ideation we, we provided, this this draft we, we, we discussed with you all. It didn't get into a lot of detail on that. It mostly was following this California model of the hierarchy and how to prioritize that. Um, it did talk about source separation is the and then two different options it was like source separation is required now in this future state and there's two pathways that you either have to keep it separate all the way or there was a cost plus kind of model like 10 percent over cost and then you could go with the other alternative if it was cheaper that was that was what new jersey had used that mostly as an alternative to disposal in their organic stuff um but we didn't get into what packaging is easily to manually take apart and should be required to be done that way. Where that line is, that's a difficult conversation. Yeah, I think we can come to the question of where the line is next. I think we have to decide sort of the framework right. and where that then fits in. And I think the other part that, you know, going to Billy's points about having a whole view of this, let's not lose track of the fact that plenty of that packaging itself is our high quality recyclable materials. And so source separation in theory pr protects all streams. You know, it, it makes sure that those those high quality plastic clamshells 
are ending up in the recycling stream. When they get commingled, we lose the ability to recycle those things. So this isn't just about organics. This is about managing the entirety of the resource stream that's coming out of various operations. And you know, the organics part is only one part of the law. We haven't really, and actually it would be really nice to hear from you guys about from the more the dry goods recycling standpoints, how commingling and the loss of recyclable materials to the landfill or incineration as a result of commingling how that sugars off too, because I think we have to consider that as we we filter through the organics part. Yeah. So like right now, in the other parts of the law, are you allowed to just throw like plastic in the trash? Because that's essentially what that, without sort of separating, that's what's ultimately happening. I mean, no, the law doesn't allow that. Um, plastics that are recyclable one and two, uh, those those are the only landfill ban plastics. So number five is technically okay. you can throw in the trash. Yeah, black number five food containers. Yeah. So how like how have you guys reconciled within the context of both the source separation piece for organics and with the recycling rules, the allowance of a, a technology that ends up meaning that those plastics, the one and twos, are going yeah. to disposal. It kind of comes down to the these unique situations where you have large amounts of something that are off spec actually i've seen blank's warehouse over at all cycle and you end up with some of these partly because of requests from customers to do something with it other than disposal um like crates and crates of axe body spray and the black plastic kind of thing you know um and it doesn't square well because it's not it's still got the product in it so you can't recycle it it's got food waste in it right and um but some of these things could be separated that's the point right. I'm not, you know there right. yes there, I'm, I'm saying yeah. there is a line where it can't be and where i think we all like if we want to work backwards i think we probably have consensus about that that there is a role for for not source separating certain materials for certain reasons and we can define those later yep. but from an overarching standpoint that clamshell people have been opening it up the clamshell shaking the cookies out for years and recycling the clamshell uh, we now have easily unpacked materials that don't aren't necessitated for mechanical separation, not getting source separated, and as a result, not fulfilling the obligation of the law, as far as I can tell. So, so this overarching framework of source separation keeps us a little more true. It gives us a north star to work towards, and then it gives us the space if we take it to then define where it's appropriate exemptions from that. But having them be parallel means that we're not framing it with exemptions and therefore it is like this sort of wild west scenario where we're undermining other parts of the law where would you guys propose exemptions in that well for now we could just say like that there are exemptions i think we we're not even in the agreement that they're like right. exactly how to do the framework so i feel like we could just if, if we can agree yeah. there should be exemptions somewhere that's enough for now we can come back to what those are once we agree on a more of a framework Aaron? so i just had a question if i'm reading the second charge it doesn't ask us to prescribe anything it just says should we modify its existing policy so are we supposed to be coming up with these exemptions and suggestions or is it a yes or no question <laughs> but, i mean i think those are the that i think those exemptions ultimately are part of the answer to that question probably i cannot speak for senator bray but i think if he were here he would say you know yeah you could obviously take the short direct route and just say yes or no to this question but we were we were hoping the stakeholders would come with some ideas when I spoke to him early on, before we even gathered, he said, I hope you come out with some good ideas. <laughs> that was about all I got. So, so for help too, one of the handouts, at, I don't know if it was the last meeting or the previous meeting was an internal draft of interpreting all of these things that didn't end up getting adopted, but sort of displays like another line of reasoning that I think is a useful reference point um, and sort of does unpack of that framework of it's hard for these things to be exist in parallel they need to be more integrated i think that would go the same for all the compost facilities right too like what's the acceptable material right like if we're really gonna look at it holistically you got to look at source separation and say 
what's accepted at each compost facility and do we have that same take i totally agree but i think plastics that, and other stuff yeah. like that yeah i mean i think that there's always going to be um you know different plastics recyclers will take different numbers you know there's always going to be some of that differentiation but i think the point of the state's role is to define the baseline and then there can be differentiation in that um so i think this key piece of like or i think this is the key piece of do we need one for guidance framework which in this case would be source separation and then build exceptions from there or can we somehow sustain these these totally parallel interpretations which to me seems intellectually dissonant like i just don't understand how that could work but So, in reviewing the three people who submitted comments earlier, uh, and I understand Mike's done it since, uh, there's consistency among the three of us, obviously three of seven, not very helpful, but um, that commingling is a major point there that uh, is complicating the issue. And I think it's spelled out fairly clearly in that document that Tom just referenced, which was written by Agency Natural Resource Staff in 2019. Um, and I referenced it in my comments, uh, but it's also on the website and it's been shared. Uh, I think Ben passed it around perhaps several weeks or several meetings ago. Um, and it's it's similar to what the, the one from 2020 was, but it's very different in that it specifies you can't commingle these things and here's why. Or um, So I think it would be, it's not like rewriting anything it's already been written it was an earlier interpretation and uh tom mentioned it was interpreted differently by um agency council later on but i think there's a lot of hearing from the other stakeholders who have been on these calls it seems like there's and from you know I, i'm representing the composters perspective and i'm uh I've heard from the composting association of vermont as well that um Reverting to that earlier draft would very easily uh, hit those points uh, that we're all in agreement. That, sorry, not all of us, but those who have spoken are in agreement uh, would would satisfy the source separation um, clarification that I think we long for. So I know if folks want to look it up if they haven't seen it or haven't read it yet, but it's on the website and uh, we all got a paper copy of it as well. We can share screens on that if you wish. If you wish. Maybe. Is there? Do you know the title? Is it? I mean, what's, yeah. What's the name of that document? I, and which link folder it, I can link it in the chat. I believe from the website the title is 2019.08.05. Draft memo food residuals management policy B2 all together. That was a little too fast for my typing ability. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, post it in the chat. Yeah, he's about to post it. Okay. The link is just in the com chat right now, I believe. Look at how fast. Wow. Secondary question while that's coming up. Um, if in the scenario where we were in to, to something like this previous version, is there a secondary step that would need to happen in statute to allow the off or clarification? Off offload the um, source separation component? In your mind to, to send things to the DPAC route, or is that? Uh, yeah, the, I think clarification around those exemptions is still, you know, because DPAC wasn't imagined perhaps in the original authoring of the legislation. Uh, we're, it's, I think we're everybody's in agreement, as far as I'm aware, that there are places like DPAC has an important role in Vermont's um, solid waste, sorry, organics management uh, system. And if we can spell out a little bit, uh, how and why and where that makes the most sense for the you know maximum benefit, maximum energy um, production, maximum you know minimal risk uh, in terms of you know these unknowns around uh, soil protection and PFAS and and microplastics. I think there's it, yeah we could we should could and should and I don't know about us in the next ten minutes, but that there should be more clarification around those exemptions because DPAC is important. And I think by source separating, we're not saying anything 
other than that, that 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 we want we want to we want both. We want we want the ability to do all these other things with this um, valuable commodity, which is food waste. And there's going to be a lot of circumstances uh, every time a freezer or a cooler at a grocery store goes down where we're not going to be able to compost or or send those to animal feed directly um, or donate. And therefore, we need DPAC. Uh, food manufacturing, the ice cream pints, you know, there's there's important there's important pathways for which that is the best answer. So if we can make those exemptions clear, um, and I don't know if that means in the statute or or um, otherwise, but yes, I think more clarification would be necessary. Um, but I think as a starting point, if we can pick up on that that policy that's on the screen now. Uh, and and make that again, or you know, revert to that, and make that policy that that would uh, solve a lot of the issues that have been voiced by oh. the folks who have submitted comments. This isn't the, part, the one I'm looking at. Uh oh, the one on the screen August is different 20. than the one you sent the link to. Yeah, um, it's the one of those two versions with the same date because the, the one, one I have has, has the hierarchy on it. The uh, one you sent the has a date of of oh five. The one on the screen has a date of oh seven. Go. Oh, Josh, you're looking at version three. I think 05. We're looking at ver Tom and Dan are looking at version two. Yep. Okay. True. I stopped sharing this one then. Um, I guess for the sake of simplicity. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the one that got passed around. You uh -oh. sent the word doc, right? Word doc? This is what you passed out. match this before I send the link to the, that one. Uh, sorry, I sent the wrong version too. The other version too is on its route. <clears throat> this is the chat then? Yeah, the bottom link. Okay, I'll, I'll go to the chat. So the second link in the chat is the actual document I was referencing, I believe. But I think that was written, uh, and I think the folks who have made comments uh, shared them with the body so far, and those many of the folks who have been in the wings and have commented or submitted uh, supporting documents are all in agreement that that would be a good starting point for uh, clarification around source separation. And then you know, the question, a few minutes ago, yes, more clarity on DPAC, where where and when and how that makes sense as an exemption to what is otherwise source separation kind of standard. And going back to who we, you know, when we heard from invited speakers, we did hear from a couple of grocers, um, both members of uh, Aaron's group, and one of them was clear that they liked the rules the way they are. They liked the simplicity, I think, and the efficiency. Um, and then we also heard from another large grocer from Burlington with two outlets that uh, said that they um, didn't need, you know, that they, they had no problem uh, source separating at their uh, locations. Uh, we did hear from Mike, I think, earlier that uh, by requiring source separation as as originally interpreted, perhaps when the law was written, uh, and in this version that we're looking at now, that the challenges might be around transportation and and additional vehicles. Is that right? Yeah. Um, so there there are some things to be worked out if this is move forward, but um, I think my opinion, it does, it gets us the furthest towards ensuring that the maximum amount of organics are diverted for highest and best use, and we can still make use of this pretty incredible technology that we didn't have as in our collective toolbox as of two years ago. Two years? Yeah. Yeah, it, it hinges on in some cases. <laughs> right. And that's the that's the tough to define. Yeah, language. Well, 
but I think again, like that creates a space. It's it's saying here's the framework, and then yes, you can use these things, but it's it's clearly defined. It's not just open um, season, you know. And I think that's the part that's problematic right now is that it's you know everybody's asking for clarity, but but right now pursuing these parallel things creates a lack of clarity. Cl clarifying one within the context of the other creates. Um, pristine clarity. So we, we still have to have clarity on outlets too, right? On the other outlets, right? So for me, my perspective is if you go down the source separate path, right? Then that should be able to flow wherever they want to take that, right? Whether it's deep back and it goes to anaerobic digestion, that's just a different way to look at composting as a whole, right? There's anaerobic digestion versus creating soils. And I think there needs to be a lot more science as what is more beneficial, right? And I think for me, that same should rule should apply for any of the compost facilities. Like, but, what uh, is that? Yeah. What is that acceptable material that's coming in? Because that'll give me clarity. Because right now, I can tell you, everywhere that I bring stuff has a different acceptable list, which ca causes a lot of confusion to say, hey, where are we going to go? And if this, if the playing field is all level, and this is what what we're going to allow to be accepted at Vermont compost facilities, it's easy. I can follow that rule. I can regulate it out to train all my staff. So it's not like, oh, you're in Johnson, you have to do this. You're in Burlington, you have to do this. You're in Middlebury, you have to do this. You're in, you know, and that's where it becomes much harder for us even just to train and manage staff because guess what? Someone down here has a different perspective than someone over here. So I, I think that's another thing. And I would look at it on a very simplistic level. Anyone that's sending material to, um, like a soil amendment that they test for, you know, they, they have testing protocols that they have to test constantly. And I think that's the other piece with food waste is there's such variability in the material that you're getting every day that you could have no issues for two months and then you got material that could cause you an issue, right? So absolutely, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think that I, I'm, I don't see this through the lens of compost versus digestion to me. Both are important tools. That's why they're equal. There's not a, a, you know, going back to the hierarchy piece. That's why they're not on separate lines. Um, and they both need to be accountable to the legacy they leave in the soil. That's the end game. Yep. And so source separation, imperfect as it is, creates, you know, a framework where we can keep improving. I think all compost operators should be held to a high standard and and be expected to do a better job clarifying what they can and can't accept and, and holding that line. Uh, so it's not just it's not di digestion versus compost to me. It's the frame, source separation is the framework in which right. both exist. Yeah. And then you can decide where that goes from that source separation as the start. Here's the start. But here's what we mean by source separation. Right. And, and by not having that clarity, we don't get to make that decision or generators don't get to make that decision. Haulers don't get to make that decision necessarily because it's already contaminated from the get go. And so that's what I think we're trying to prevent that contamination at the very, you know, out of the gate gives us a lot more opportunities for using that material in other ways. Um, and sometimes that's going to be compost and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's going to be animal feed, which wasn't an option if you're, if you've got your packaging mixed in. So anyway, that's my pitch for uh, reverting to version two, two from with a five in there somewhere. The one that's on the screen. Okay. We have 15 minutes left. I want to sincerely apologize to folks joining remotely for our technical difficulties earlier. Um, I, I don't know what to say. We've seen to come back on. That's good. But we do have a hard stop at 1130. So I can say from the agency's perspective, it's going to be super helpful, regardless of where you fall on these issues, for you to give us your own words uh, perspective, written perspective on this, so we can incorporate it into the report. Um, and if you have ideas on directions or or whatever, um, please put those ideas in on paper and send them to Ben. Um, so to make it crystal clear, please send in your your recommendations on the three charges um, in the agenda to Ben Gothier um, post meeting. And do we want to meet as a group again or? Uh, send stuff around via email. Email has not been working so well with this group. At least 100% participation has not been achieved. So it's been difficult. 
Um, what would you like to do? Let's see, like the options are either we, we get back together either in a meeting form or on email, which I agree is I've been working very well. Or we hand it over and say, OK, we've set our bids and and you go with it and you produce this report. But the challenge is, is that there's material that hasn't been submitted yet um, that the rest of us haven't seen. So um, that complicates things. So I think if I think we need to look at it collectively through one means or the other um, and be able to react to things. So uh, I know. I know people don't want to meet again, and I know that we're out of time to meet again, <laughs> so I don't know how that happens, but. I'd like to see us, regardless of the format, challenge ourselves to find the areas of common interest and where we have agreement and then use the. The sort of notes by stakeholder as as sort of the follow up to the places that as the places we don't. Um, so. I think. I mean, even the meetings aren't working great because we're not getting the submissions ahead of time, stuff like that. So I, I think there's the the missing piece is the resolve to 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 get in and do the do the the thinking uh, part of it. And I don't know what the best format for folks is. I don't really care, but I think we owe it to the agency staff, we owe it to the legislature, we owe it to the state to like really try to find some places where we can have something to offer back in a meaningful way to the legislature. Uh, and I think we can do that if we can sort of stay on track and really hammer on some of these things and really think about a framework um, as opposed to opinion about something. I would say the format you have used so far, though I can't, I didn't, I was trying to over, you know, see it off of somebody else's screen. I can't see it that closely, but it looked like that worked and, and follows that, you know, it still has places for our areas of disagreement and in our individual submissions, but you have, started on the summary path with the uh, incomplete data or incomplete submissions. And I presume that you'll be able to add to that as more submissions come yes. in. And yes, and provided you guys get us um, your your written comments, we can get it in there. And I think the, the more directive you are about where you want it to go, that's helpful to the legislature. The hardest part for us is writing the areas of commonalities. That is the most dangerous place for us to get out in front of you, and I don't intend to do that. Um, it's very hard to be over email getting feedback and coming to consensus that way, which may not be possible. So it, to me, I think where we're at is a document which is um, representative of all your various views on these three things with your ideas around it. Um, and and with a, a preamble of how many times we met and who you were and who the stakeholders were and who we invited in as speakers. But otherwise, I think that's what we're going to likely end up with given time, which may be OK. I don't think I'm the person to do it, uh, but with the 10 minutes that remain, does, would it make sense to try to just voice bullets so that we where we think we are in agreement? If anybody wants, was so brave to. Try to do that just so you've got. And maybe maybe reading off of there is how to do it, but yeah, it's uh, it's even tricky there. The one thing where it seemed like there's agreement is the hierarchy should apply to each generator, um, and then there was some differentiation on how to get there. But that was the one thing where it seemed like everyone was on board. Uh, in my interpretations. The next one where there was almost a majority uh, was, um, I mean, almost consensus, uh, but certainly the majority was uh, whether A and R should amend the policy. Uh, most people thought yes. Um, with a few folks that disagreed with that. So beyond that, it gets kind of into the weeds pretty quick, but those are the. the well, I mean, just just to that, like even with the third question, just to have something to offer you right today. And we all agree that there is a place within the entire organics management system for depackaging. Uh, I would agree to that. Yeah, yeah. Any, yeah. sure. I agree. Yes. Six. We had six out of six. Awesome. Good Can job, team. Agree? Way to go. <laughs> yeah, we got something. <laughs> Can we agree that um, there there should be some constraints on the application of depackaging such that um, unpackaged organic materials and packaged or organic materials are not commingled? 
as, ever, ever, or as the norm? As as the norm, as the baseline within this, within the legislation, within the statute, with, with the reason being of concern about um, mitigating or preventing other uses, but also potential pollution issues. Like, can we? Is there a, a place that we can draw a line there? I would agree with that. I would probably be on the other. I'm like 50 50. I haven't really kind of figured out where I would land on that. I, I just think it gets back to the testing and, and for soil amendments. So anything coming out of the facility, I would frame it more that all organics facilities, whether it's DPAC, compost facilities, there should be third party testing. Maybe on size of generator, like if you're a, a thousand tons, but you have the, to test it, once a month. For, but let, let's stick with the the framework for the flow of material because like testing is always like a backstop; it's not a policy. So like, if if something doesn't have plastic in it, is adding plastic to it potential? You know, like is that concerning? And therefore, I think the question is sort of like, would you draw a line to be adding plastic into something? But I, that's I think already that's separated. the hard part. We sort of separated studies and there's not much data out there but whether you have source separated or DPAC you're going to have plastics and other contaminants in it right I, w I don't think that's actually the data that we saw but I mean like I think um well, but, but but it is actually like you know what I mean I, I I know everyone in compost struggles with contamination at catch it back well I mean right that's just a piece of it so yeah you have source separated but there's still going to be some contamination and, and and I've seen where there's great composters that do a great job. There's great deep packers that do a great job. And there's been a whole list of other people that maybe they don't do as great of a job. So if source separated, you think is going to fix your problem, it's not going to fix it a hundred percent. Right. Cause there also needs to be levers that we can pull to say, okay, Hey, state of Vermont, we have this one operator, this one, just say school that is not complying. They keep putting, material that they shouldn't in there, what are our levers to then manage that appropriately, which means that maybe we have to dump their compost as waste because we can't kind of the same thing we do for recycling, right? Like if there's too much trash in the recycling, we have to dump the recycling as trash. But that's what we're looking for, those levers, right? To be able to say source separation in this case, you know, the commingling isn't appropriate, you know, yeah. and that's where ANR has the leverage to come in, you know, and try to influence. All right, let's stick to things that we can don't have to talk through then. Um, I mean, I don't need to drive the questions. Let's just, if everybody wants a popcorn style for the last five minutes, just throw out some questions where we might be able to like take the flip these things around and find the easier things to agree on. Um, I think there's agreement that everybody would like more uh, scientific study on everything mentioned. Heard that a lot. Here, here. Okay. Yes. I agree with that. And so, presumably, support from the state and funding research and speedy research. Well, conveniently, we have a study coming right up. <laughs> uh, and including on like the effects of PFAS and microplastics on on human health and in the environment. I think uh, we heard from a couple folks who were very concerned about that, um, and they seem, you know, it's a terrifying subject if you start paying too much attention to it. So uh, finding out more about that in general, I think. And, uh, and, an under look and I think an understanding of what's already existing in the environment right now. We don't even have a baseline. Well, sure. And, you know, uh, and how much plastic is on the side of the road? How much plastic is in the front lawn of the state house? How much is in your crop fields? How much is in your compost? You don't you don't know. Right. Um, I was just going to finish up on that PFAS thought that like looking at what other states are doing, particularly Maine, who seems to be uh, taking a different approach and and, and and being a little bit proactive. Uh, and, and then what everybody has voiced, I think, is trying to cut it off at the source. There's legislation in place in Maine where that's already happened. So giving a nudge to the legislature to look upstream in trying to solve some of these issues, I think would be great. And then I would assume that we would all agree that, you know, yeah, we got to figure it out on the tail end, but but also some teeth on the on the front end of the process, you know, where these things are generated would be great. Yes.
I would agree with that. Is that a point of consensus in terms of PFOS specifically, like putting more focus on where the generate the people who are selling it and making it and distributing it in Vermont? Absolutely. Yeah, EPR. Yeah. yeah. I agree with that. All that consensus. I mean, do you, right. do, you, do you agree with testing and protocols for all anyone for soil amendments? Totally. I just think that's a like a that's that's a, a that's in a different sort of a, you know like um, that's what you do at the end. But we're talking about the like the upstream th things that end up framing that. So I'm just trying to like not lose track of the yeah. the overarching policy framework that things like testing then emerge out of. So I, I just think that. It, to try to get to an outcome, we need to sort of stay on track with that that framing is all I'm sort of proposing. I was going to say, if anyone has any issues finding documents, I know I've slung a lot of links at everybody. Let me know and I can help get those to you uh, in short order so you can prepare your comments. Just let me know what you're looking for and I'll help you find it. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, to, to help land the plane here, um, we've got a couple minutes left. I want to sincerely thank you guys. I think while it feels like we maybe didn't reach consensus on everything, I actually think this group is fairly cohesive, very respectful, and you, you will be called upon to testify, no doubt, probably in the session. Um, and you can voice your perspectives at that time as well. But to, it, to help us land the plane on the report, um, we can only get you back for your input, for your feedback, the, the report with your comments when you get them to us. So as soon as you get us those comments, we can put them in and, and circulate that draft and keep it up to date. You guys want to throw out a deadline for that submission? I, I would like, I mean, uh, I, I would I would even be so bold as to say end of this week because I, I don't feel that that's too unreasonable. But if people need more time, we, we can see where it goes. Um, well, I think we were just throwing out like initial responses to these. Those weren't comprehensive. So, I mean, I'm assuming we're going to, that's that's not the end game. Right? No, no, not the end game on the report. Right. Not so, the I mean, final draft. Like, if we could just get something in incomplete as it might be. And these are, you know, this is, I think maybe, I mean, Mike, you're saying you're still formulating some stuff. And I think uh, probably others are as well. So it's hesitant to put it out on paper where your position is. Um, if, you, if you need more time, the group can suggest otherwise. I, um, I mean, I, I honestly put out my thoughts to on the timeline to meet the timeline and didn't sort of hedge to have the perfect language and yeah. framing. So I well, I think there's a little piece of like, let's just get some stuff going. We can agree that it's not the final version of anything and come back to it just because we're going to it's going to start getting hard to we're going to need more dialogue after I, this. Yeah. Yeah. How do you want to do that? Right now? Well, we got to go. There's a the group that has this meet this room right after. I think more than likely you're going to end up with Tom said this, Mike said this, Dan says this, Jenna says this, and that's okay. Um, and wordsmithing what Dan said from you is like, that's what Dan says. It's his record gets to stand, you know? So I think that's okay if that's how far we get uh, in the light of time. If we can help you um, sideboard that to some other sure. <laughs> Aaron, go ahead. Sorry, um, I didn't. Um, can we say Monday by like noon? I have my annual meeting this week, so if I can have everything sent to you by Monday at noon, I can guarantee that. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think, you know, basically it's a copy and paste exercise for us. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm leaning on Ben very heavily here on the on the part where you submit your comments and we paste them into the document. The writing of the summary of how those everybody's perspectives collide, that's the harder part. And uh, if you all don't agree with anything we say, I think that's where we have to walk that back and keep it really simple. That's going to be hard over email. That's my expectation. I mean, I'm open to doing a 45 minute call. OK. Let's get. Let's see how far we get on a draft report. We'll send that to you, and then Mia and Ben, um, Mia might be able to do a doodle for that type of a call to debrief the report as it stands. Have okay. to walk through it piece by piece. Does that sound good? I think so. All right. All right. Great. Uh, I see some people maybe gathering out there. So thank you all very much. Thanks to the participants um, and especially other stakeholders who have been.